Hey, this is Lynn Davis with Pangeality Productions, and we're up here on Whidbey Island at the 40th anniversary celebration of the Whidbey Institute, this incredible place that's been bringing people together to do amazing work that the world needs. And I'm here uh, right now with my man, Dan, uh, Adam, what's your last name? Rosenthal? Adam Rosenthal. Rosendahl, all right. And last night I was witness to something, an activity that he led that I enjoyed a lot and I wanted to share it with you all. So here we are. Good to be with you, Adam. All right. Cool. So, so tell me a little bit about late night art. First of all, just in a nutshell, what is it? And then we'll get into sort of how it works and, you know, what it's all about for you. Sure. Um, so late night art is an experience that involves collaborative art making, um, a four course dinner of delicious food, and facilitated dialogue with. Um, large groups of people, usually from lots of different backgrounds. Um, it's gone on in four different countries and happens regularly in Vancouver, British Columbia, and also in Oakland, California. Cool. So it, uh, it's an activity that you personally lead and created and thought up, or tell me about the sort of origins of it. Yeah, it was founded by um, me and my friend Julian Thomas, who lives in Vancouver. Um, initially came out of a facilitation workshop that we were taking in Portland, Oregon, and it has turned into... Um, a business and uh, a really fun and interesting opportunity for large social gatherings to happen in a different way that I haven't really experienced before. So we're trying to create a more intentional party um, that really brings out creativity in people that don't consider themselves artists. Nice. Tell me a little bit about how that social interaction is different and from what and what about it is different in a way that sort of piques your interest. Um, I live, I live in Oakland and I go to a lot of events in the Bay Area in San Francisco and what I find is generally um, I want to connect with people on a deeper level but I don't, um, I guess there's not that many opportunities for me to do so in a way that feels really comfortable. Um, in late night art it is a facilitated event so I'm actually asking questions um, and people have very short periods of time to interact with strangers, sometimes using visual arts and sometimes actually conversing with each other on really deep issues, sometimes um, questions that people don't get a chance to think about by themselves. And because it is facilitated, there's a sense that everyone else is doing it and people are held in a really safe space and they actually respond on a much deeper level, I think, than they would in a more party setting that's a little less regulated. Cool. So what does it actually look like? What's different about it and what, what, is, uh, what does it look and feel like? I guess you've told me a lot about what it feels like. Yeah. Now tell me what it looks like. Um, at Late Night Art, you can imagine you walk in, there's usually about 50 or 60 people. The first course of dinner is out. There's usually um, a live musician that's booked. So we have music playing and people gather around one long table that's covered in a hard stock paper with watercolors and a variety of art supplies down the center. Um, I'm a DJ and so I will ask a question or give a prompt, I'll turn up some music and then everyone in the center um, along the entire table will respond using the art supplies that are on the table. So they'll be drawing and after about a couple minutes they'll rotate chairs, so they'll move one chair over. Um, throughout the night people are engaging with strangers um, around these different prompts and dialogues and they're also creating art that is their responses to these different directives. All right, so give me uh, some examples of the kinds of questions you might throw out there as food for thought in those short intervals. Sure. Um, it could be anything from what happens to you after you die, draw that, to um, draw a dream for a person in this room that you've never met before. And then I might have them actually go find that person and explain the dream that they're drawing for them. Mm, nice. And give me a couple other examples. Sure. Um, I can uh, oftentimes we'll pass around samples of food and have people draw the experience of actually tasting the food. Um, we have people actually looking each other in the eyes and drawing their experience of connecting with a stranger through eye contact. Um, I remember last night one of the funny ones when people really got excited or were just more animated was the holding the hand of the person next to you and guiding their hand and creating something and simultaneously having their hand held by the person to the other side of them. Yeah. Tell me about those kinds of exchanges. Totally. I think um, as much as possible I'm trying to engage different parts of the brain and give people the experience of letting go as well as taking control. So um, with that particular question there's a 
a challenge of actually releasing all tension from one hand and then taking control of the other hand. So being able to um, really hold both is really difficult for a lot of people, and it's a really fun exercise. Cool. And tell me about the role of the music. How do you choose it when you're spinning the jams, and how do you choose which musicians to bring in? And I don't know if last night was an exception, but you had a handful of different musicians, each of them taking turns in very different type of music they were bringing. Yeah. Um, I've been creating mixes since I was a little kid, so I'm really interested in how music affects um, different environments. And so I'm very conscious of the music I choose. I usually spend over 10 hours creating a playlist for each event um, to try to customize it to the group of people that I think that are going to be coming and also to keep it fresh every single time. So that's very carefully chosen. I'll often not have uh, live musicians come in and do create somewhat of a soundtrack or a soundscape for people to be creating art too. And so um, last night we had Gloria Brennan playing fiddle and then there was a gentleman named John who's traveling from the East Coast who plays the hung, which is a Swiss instrument made out of metal, sort of like a steel drum. That was really cool. A little mini spaceship. Yeah. Nice. And give me a sense of the kinds of, I mean, you're talking about this as a business. Is this proprietary? Is this something that you put on and perform and collaborate, uh, coordinate and, um, or is this something that is sort of a template? We hear a lot about this open source use of knowledge and information and technology here from other people. Is late night art a proprietary thing or is it something that you're putting out into the world to sort of give other people the tools to do as well? Well, it's definitely something I invite anyone to use these elements, which are put on really good music, cre create a delicious meal, and bring people together around creating art together. Anyone can do this, of course, but um, what late night art is, a, is a really well organized and facilitated event that actually draws people out um, and creates a container for this transformational experience. And I've done this um, with businesses, with corporate groups, um, people that work on teams um, to unify a staff or to like really people <clears throat> get people into their different parts of their brain and solving problems and collaborating with each other. I've done it to kick off large-scale conferences. Um, like last night um, was the first night of the 40th anniversary of the Whitby Institute. We did it with 112 people. Um, but I've also and if you're not familiar, make sure to check out whitbyinstitute.org and all the wonderful work that's going on here and incredible uh, all sorts of seminars and uh, the work that's being done here and rippling out around the world. Definitely worth a visit at whitbyinstitute.org. Yeah. Um, corporate groups, conferences, and then there's social art events where I'm really bringing as diverse a group of people together as possible. And part of that is learning across difference. So using this process, which is really fun, but also being able to engage people who might be 18 years old with people who are 80 years old um, and have each other look in the eyes and draw together. Nice. Yeah. So give me a sense again about what you, supplies you put out on the table and what's available to folks. Sure. Um, Generally, I have everything set up. We have watercolors, pastels, colored pencils, a variety of art supplies, and um, and some high quality paper. That so it really feels good to be creating. Um, that sense of uh, when people pick up a pencil, it, like actually, it just feels feels nice. Everything's really set up for them. Nice. And the role of the food is it? it um... Tell me a little bit about the role of the food. Is the it's it's sort of sewn together by the fact that you, the table upon you which you just ate and shared the meal becomes the table upon which the art is created. Part of it is symbolic. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something to be said about having every single person who's in the room sitting around one table and dining together before and during this experience that really unifies the group. But I think there's also something about what I say is tricking people to be creative and creating an environment that feels really safe and comfortable with really good music, really good food, um, and warm company. And, and in that space of feeling really comfortable and held by the group, people are, they come out of their shells, they take much um, bigger challenges, and I think that they, they actually get so much more out of this event. Nice. And to what extent is this endeavor about the the artwork that's created as opposed to the process of getting there is it typical with late night art that you turn around and save what's been created for presentation or for uh, you know a later exhibition or it's really more about process than product 
it's, it's definitely more about process than product. Sometimes th there will be professional artists in the room that I'll invite to come in, and in, in the process of the event, we create beautiful things with or without professional artists. Sometimes it looks like child art. Oftentimes at the end of it, um, each event I'll give scissors out and people will take out pieces that they enjoy, and I've seen a lot of people bring them home as a reminder of a certain um, open, explorative, creative part of themselves that they don't access very often. Um, but I've still been exploring how can we destroy this in a more symbolic way at the end of each event so that it really feels like a completion. Nice. Cool. Is there a place where people who are interested in late night art can learn more about it? Sure. Yeah. Um, LateNightArt.com. It's night is still spelled N-I-T-E, so late night art. All right. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing me. Again, it's Lynn Davis with Pangeality Productions. We're here at the Whidbey Institute. 40 years of amazing transformational work going on here. That website's Win uh, WhidbeyInstitute.org. My website, as you know, is Pangeality.com, and I'm here with Adam Rosendahl with Late Night Art, and that's N-I-T-E Art.com. If you want to learn more, check them out. Thanks so much, Adam. All right. Peace.